Everyone came to the table in the beginning. VFX, the production designer, director, and there was a philosophy from the start that we're going to have a head-to-toe suit, and it was our job to make sure it was very mobile and sleek, we could work in it and do stunts in it. We wanted to try to make the suit as close to Martin Wist, the production designer, design as possible. We took Martin's designs, which were in 3D, and then conformed them all to fit Joel, our actor. We take scans of the actor and tweak that design model. It's a process that we've gone through many times in many different shows. We figure out exactly which pieces should be hard, which pieces will be magnetic, or which pieces will break apart for movement, for ease of taking the suit off, allowing for batteries and lights, whether we're using silicones or foams, then we go back in and adjust our model accordingly. We remodel all the pieces to get them up to a high-res quality because we've got to rapid prototype all of the parts. Basically, it's up to my department to come up with what we need to build based on what the shot's calling for, if it's a hero suit or something that's just for display purposes in the film. We assess what needs to be done and find the right technology to do it. The model shop takes those 3D prints and we start cleaning them up, putting all the little details that we may leave out in the uh, 3D model just for the ease of growing. Once a part comes to us, we have to decide how to split the part in order to create or generate the pieces for the suit. The idea is that it's a super hard, bulletproof surface and it's not supposed to flex, so uh, wherever it's possible, the materials were, were rigid, but anywhere in the joints, we try to keep it as soft as possible. The stunt suits were made out of a soft polyfoam, so they could run, jump, get pulled. We hybrid a lot of materials when building a suit for, for comfort, for ease of movement. We have a design that is made in a computer. It does not always translate perfectly to the human body, which means after all the pieces are run, we have to figure out how to assemble and make it work. Make it comfortable, cut away, add in. We sew, we glue, we use fabric, we use foam. We use webbing, we use snaps, we use zippers, all kinds of different material to keep everything together. Okay, slowly back out. Oh, nice. Hi, handsome. <laughs> How was that? I felt like I gave birth to myself. Yeah. <laughs> Joel was able to come in for multiple fittings, almost once a week, which helped us in the long run to get him moving as inhibited as possible, as well as comfortable as possible. We had to work hand in hand with the design team in determining the thicknesses of the undersuit to create the best fit for the actor so he can perform well, so the suit looks good, there's a little fine line there. The helmet was particularly challenging just to get the visor tight fitting to his face and sitting correctly. You have limited space because you want the heroic proportions. You want it sleek and streamlined. The biggest challenge is finding room in the suit because the actor fills most of it. When we try to incorporate electronics into a suit like this, it presents its own unique set of challenges, mostly because of the space limitation, but also because of the harsh environment. The inside of the suit gets really hot, the actor sweats. We had to shield all of our electronics for that. Heat was always an issue. We actually had a cool vest on underneath, which is a vest that race car drivers wear. That has tubing running through it that we run cold water. We kind of became his lifeline on set. He starts heating up, I run in, we'll plug it in and cool him down. That was through the summer in Toronto. The winter months, he was actually fine because he had an insulated suit that kept him nice and warm while everybody else was freezing. This was the V1, this was the one that was kind of the homage to the original suit. The original one had many colors, a lot of them were forced colors. A lot of purples, a lot of blues, pinks, greens even. I incorporated those colors in this suit. It gives that pearl kind of iridescent color, what everybody kind of remembers Robocop looking like. His visor was made out of like a sunglass material, painted in such a way that the actor could actually see out of the mask. We created many iterations of the V3 suits as he's battle damaged and shot up. We built a couple of different full-size EM-208s, which were used for lighting reference and background. What we're basically looking at here is the EB-207. Since it was for display purposes, this was done 100% from head. 
to toe in SLA technology. SLA is the original 3D printing platform which involves a vat of resin and a laser with high wattage that shoots into it to produce its pattern part. This robot came back in sections in a clear resin that was basically sanded up, reinforced, and then painted and post-processed. And these suits worked hand in hand with digital. Jamie Price, the visual effects supervisor on this show, collaborated with us closely early on. They would use actual topography off of the suit and use that as a marker to kind of then tweak him to be impossibly lean. There were a certain amount of scenes that were, were too dangerous for the actor that they had to put in a 100% CG character. Having the suit there, regardless if it's actually in the scene at the end of the day or not, it helps the digital department make that character believable in that environment. Well, those suits were challenging, man. <laughs> but you know, a challenge is fun. Nothing is impossible, and if you can actually make it be functional without going out of its design, that's what's fun. I think it's a very topical smart film, and I'm really glad we had a chance to be a part of this.